Father, we just pause to thank you for spared life. We want to thank you that we have showers of blessing in the rain this morning. And we thank you, Lord, that you continue to be with your people. Father, in these times that seem so unprecedented, we just ask that we continue to have an all-consuming love for you and for your word. We ask forgiveness of our sins and shortcomings, and you ask that you continue to abide with us now, not just now, but throughout today, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. So as Sister Louise was saying, when we think of the book of Song of Solomon, um, we think of it as a love story of things that are happening between a couple. And um, I was sharing with, with her earlier, some of you were on earlier, in my days of teaching, you know, when young people start to talk to each other, and they're trying to use all these lyrics. You know, I used to say to them, go to the book of Song of Songs and you will find the real lyrics that you want to share. And then sometimes they would come back to me and said, Miss, all of this was in the Bible. We didn't know these things were in the Bible. And, um, and sometimes it was just a way to grab their attention. But scholars have said that the book can come in four primary ways. Allegory, that means the book, the view, that view sees the book as expressing the love of God for his chosen people. Each part of the song contains some symbolic meaning. A dramatic narrative, the song expresses Solomon's own love affair with a Shulamite woman whom he takes as a wife to his palace in Jerusalem. An extended parable, this view sees the song not as an allegory seeking meaning in every verse, but as a parable of Christ and his church. And literal, this view sees Solomon celebrating the virtues of human love. And I'll just give this summary. The Song of Solomon stands alone among a thousand five songs that Solomon wrote. It is often called the Song of Songs, as Sister Louise alluded to. The song proclaims a husband's love for his wife and illustrates God's love for his people, the love that Christ has for the church, his bride. It describes how a lover cherishes his beloved and how he enjoys the way she completes him. This song implies that leaders well, must learn to love so the people cute. God has placed within their sphere of influence. We cannot separate, and I'm looking at it, as I said, from a leadership point of view, leadership from relationship. While the book vividly portrays the mutual love both parties have for each other, a love that drives them to appreciate each other and serve each other extravagantly. That this kind of love prompts the spiritual leader and the follower to go the extra mile and do more than expected. The book frequently exhibits the den and some principle. The lover relishes his beloved, cares for her, provides for her, and then some. Healthy intimate relationships create this kind of generous attitude. Far too often, some of us believe that our position forces us to remain distant from our people and those around us. We imagine that we must remain aloof and even a bit mysterious, living at a level that is unattainable to others. This is not a biblical idea. This song reveals a transparent and vulnerable spiritual leader who speaks intimately of both his strengths and his needs. He feels secure enough to quit hiding behind a smoke screen, as some of us leaders do today. What kinds of smoke screens trouble us? Consider too. I just can't open up with people. I don't have time to build relationships. I'm too busy reaching my goals. The lover in this song is honest enough to quit believing the kind of lies that we often believe today. He wouldn't think of saying, if my people are going to submit to me, if my people are not going to submit to me as a leader, I cannot tell them certain things. I cannot let them get too close to me. If I become vulnerable, people won't respect me. However, the Song of Solomon gives us new perspectives in our relationships, not just with God, but with each other. We must be able to be vulnerable and have a neighborhood of people that shows the world who Christ is. And I think for me, this is one of the things that stands out in every book of the Bible, um, that relationship that God has for mm -hmm. us. And you know that Christ sees us as his church, the, the thing that he's made the most ultimate sacrifice for. 
and his love is passionate for us. And it, it is my prayer, even as we read this book, while we see how, and you know, God has used the marriage relationship as the relationship between himself and his church, how a husband must love his wife and share and she should submit. And when you go through some of the book, you will see where it, it's so interesting, you know, the, the words and the, the, as I said, the lyrics that are used. And, um, and you really think that if, if, I mean, we don't use all of that dramatic language today, but if couples or even our relationships with each other were so caring and passionate, um, I think we will do a lot more as a church. And one of the things, as we said, the, the allegory comes out as the passionate consuming love of God. And I think when we understand that, it's easier to even see how we act in our married relationships and how we act with our relationships within, with each other in the church. It says here that most of the time when we use words like passion and love, we speak of the affection between man and woman. But have you ever thought of God's love in terms of passion? In the Song of Solomon, we see a beautiful picture of the tender devotion that God means to be shared between husband and wife, as I said before. But we also see a picture of God, the picture of love that God wants his people to share with Jesus Christ. King Solomon understood that his love was unearned and unmerited, that in many ways God poured it out and on his people despite themselves. This kind of love represents an actual communion with Christ and his church. On his part, it is a love that gives all to those with nothing gives all to those with nothing in exchange for life everlasting. And our part, it is the kind of love that inspires us to hunger for more of him, to thirst for him and for him to shine through us. As leaders and members of God's church, we must understand the relationship between Christ and his people amongst so far to more than just a religious and contractual type of arrangement. Rather, it is a relationship of love, tenderness, and passion, a relationship in which we, the bride, remain aware of our unworthiness of the bridegroom, bridegroom's love, yet bask in its limitless depths. And that is, you know, just an overview of, of verse, verse 1 of Solomon 1. And, and, you know, in some Bibles, they lay it out differently. And um, it sort of says in, in, in that first verse, you know, this is the banquet and the lady is saying, you know, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Your love is better than wine. And, you know, she, she's saying what she wants from God. But then later on in the book, we see, um, you know, what she wants from her, her lover. And, and as crazy as it sounds, I think that if, this, if we had that sort of passionate relationship with God, um, we, we would work deeper with him and grow more with him. And just the affirmation I want to leave with us this morning as leaders. Um, we saw earlier on that sometimes we, and, and I think this time, this, this time of COVID is a challenge for all of us um, as to how we really reach out and care for each other, how transparent we are with how we're feeling in terms of our mental health, our well being, everything. Um, and you know, just not hiding again, you know, we come to church on a Sabbath and we just say, how are you? I'm fine. And if I do say on a Sabbath, I'm not good today. I can almost be assured that it might be five people that are Christ up and say, what is happening? Whereas, if you do, oh, I'll pray for you. But this sort of, when we have this love for God, we really become passionate for those in our care um, and for those around us, not just our children, not just our spouses but have a love and a desire to see people have the same relationship with Christ. Leaders whom others love and loyally follow are usually those who express appreciation to their followers. They live the principle of affirmation. The Song of Solomon reveals a spiritual leader who identifies specific qualities he appreciates about his beloved, then expresses his appreciation. The marvelous let love letter shows a spiritual leader communicating love and affirmation. The follower almost always reciprocates the sentiment. Sentiment. Notice what Solomon and all great leaders do to encourage those in his care. 
you give identity, you declare what, it's, what is your appreciation and, and you appreciate and name it. You specify, be as specific as you can, no generalizations about their style. Express how they have made measurable difference in your life, quantify and magnify, encourage your followers liberally in public before their peers. And what I want us to focus on, you know, this, this book is exciting and, and um, you know, it, those who are into poetry and that sort of thing, you know, I, I remember growing up and my mom is a poet and she loves all these, she pulls all these things out for us um, and used to, t to talk about it. But as you get older and you read it and yes, it's, you know, as I said, I would tell my students go and look at things. But when I started digging deeper, and really seeing it as the relationship that we should have with God um, and some of the qualities I need as not just a leader in the church, but what I used to need as a, a you know, as a teacher and as I, I volunteer with people now because I'm, I'm not working um, physically anymore. But um, these qualities are things that I, I hold on to, affirming people, making people feel important, special, um, and, and show, and I think within our churches, it's something that we have to keep doing. Um, little things like remembering a, ch a child's birthday or just checking up on, on a family and seeing. And, you know, I know when this whole thing started and we were all put away and locked away, um, you know, I had to be shielding for 12 weeks, but it didn't stop my, you know, checking in. Yes, I have a list of people that I need to check on as, as a church leader, but it didn't stop me still even checking on my neighbors or just saying, you know, um, how are you feeling? How are you doing? How is the family? And, and you have to keep it up. I think in the first three months of the shock of everything, everybody was in a bit of panic and we all wanted to be on church and we wanted to check each other. And, you know, and six months later, we're almost going back to normal. And this is not the relationship we should have with God and with each other. The Book of Solomon is reminding us this morning that we need to have that same passionate love that Christ has for us. And when we really understand, you know, we, we, the Spirit of Prophecy says if we spend each day reflecting a bit on the cross and what Christ has done, um, we'll have a better understanding. And we don't just take him for granted and just say, you know, um, yesterday I really was crying out to the Lord when I see how they really want to just destroy the economy of some parts of, of, of England and you know, this whole thing, we know prophecy is being fulfilled, but I, I just had to pause and say, Lord, you know, we need you to intervene. And every time we think of, of ourselves, let's look at it as we look at this book and again see God has this deep, deep love for me. And what am I giving in return? Am I, uh, you know, God is the only person you can be truly vulnerable with and really tell him everything. And the lesson came home again to me. I have a four-year-old niece and my sister said, we started calling her the intercessor because she tells her parents, um, don't pray too long. I have a lot to tell Jesus. And of course, part of the prayer is always selling out all that her parents did or didn't do um, for the day. But we, while we were smiling about that, we were saying, but that is how we really should talk to God. Be our heart, be our soul, get into this love relationship with Jesus. And particularly, all of you, I think, on this platform lead in your church in one way or another. When we have that sort of deep connection with Christ, it becomes easier. You know, a lot of times, I know it's, it's difficult. It, we have issues of safeguarding, all sorts of things going on in society, and the church reflects it. But I, I, I pray that as you all go through this book and you spend time um, looking at yourselves, um, looking up, so you know, all of the things I took this morning are just from chapter one. Um, that we get into a more passionate relationship with Jesus, so that as we lead, um, as people want to follow, even as our children lead, you know, we teach our children to lead in, in their classes and to show Christ that they will see that there is something that we have that is deeper that keeps us going. You know, we, we, we're not immune to all that is going on. Christians are suffering with, with depression and mental health. We have all of these things, but God has promised to be there for us. So my prayer is today that you really get into that deeper love relationship with Christ. And for those who are married and those who have children, those who, even if you're a single parent, a deeper relationship with your family members, with your children, with your spouses, 
and with those around you. Yes, there are different types of love, but God talks about his agape love. And I think this is what he wants us to have with him and with each other. May God bless you.